and um, that will kick this off. So first, let me just tell you about Bob and then, no, I'm gonna first tell you about the lecture that we're listening to. So this lecture is titled The Art of America, How Great American Artists Revealed a New Country and Its People. Um, the people and landscapes of America from the mid 18th century to the early 20th century have been some of the most compelling subjects for artists to study, paint and photograph. In timeless images, the artist captured a new country as it evolved through some of its most transformative and turbulent eras. This lecture, so here we are, we're listening to this lecture. It's the first of four. And it will begin with today's lecture, Colonial America and the Art of the West, with works by um, New England artists Charles Wilson Peel, Benjamin West, Gilbert Stewart, and John Singleton Copley. As America rapidly expands westward, painters George Catlin, George Caleb Bingham, Thomas Moran, and Frederick Remington will each venture into the American frontier with canvas, paint, and brush to record native inhabitants, pioneers, and a seemingly endless landscape revealing a new world of beauty and wonder. So the art lecture presenter is Bob Potter, who is a graduate of Syracuse University School of Visual and Performing Arts. He spent his early career as an art director at Scholastic Magazines, Time Warner and National Geographic Television. Over the past decade, he helped create an arts therapy program for Save the Children was a corporate development officer for the National Gallery of Art, headed marketing for Mystic Seaport and is a docent at the Yale Center for British Art. He and his wife, Jean, who is a master water watercolorist and teacher, live in Old Lyme, Connecticut. So everybody, thank you for being here. And Bob, especially thank you to you. And we will hand this over to you now. And what we'll do everybody is, um, Bob, do you wanna do a halfway break? Is that what we decided? Yeah, this uh, uh, lecture today is in two parts. As Hillary said, the first part will be on colonial art and the art of the portrait. And the second will be on uh, the art of the West as artists go West in the early 19th century. And uh, so at the half after the colonial art, we'll have about a five or so minute little Q and A and people can get up, refresh their coffee, whatever. And then we'll do the second half uh, on uh, the art of the West. And uh, then we'll have a second Q and A. In total, the lecture runs uh, about an hour, hour 15, give or take how many people have questions or wanna hang out. So uh, that's, uh, that's today's format. Okay, so we're ready to hear it and what we'll do is when people do ask those questions at the halfway mark um we'll ask them to raise their hand there's a little raise your hand feature or put your hand up physically we'll we'll find you and we'll we'll unmute you okay Great. Bob. thank you all right now this is the major technology share screen <laughs> we're all learning you seem to know what you're doing Oh, the host disabled my screen sharing. Oh, why'd you do that? Oh. <laughs> Let's try that again. All right, maybe you don't want to do that. Really? Oh, yeah. oh, All right, hang on here. Not to worry. Hang on. Huh. Give it one more try. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. That should work, yes. Let's see how that works. There you go, see. Oh, wow, thank goodness, okay, that the settings were properly there because that could, have, that could have been interesting, but good, onward. Onward, onward, ever onward, there we go. Now I'm seeing on my screen just uh, the main image, but I'm seeing uh, little thumbnails down the right. How are you? seeing this, Hillary, are you just seeing my screen or are you seeing a lot of faces too? I see the three paintings across and then there's, um, there are the four or five little side um, photo, okay. photo, you know, images of people, okay. but that everyone can control that by their, in those images of the people, yeah. there are the four little options of how you want to view the screen. So sure. they should all hit maybe off to the left, the little one, that'll disappear. It'll make all the images of everybody else disappear and it'll just show your screen. 
Hopefully yeah. people are following that and can play around okay. and figure that out. Great. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, and uh, thank you all for zooming in uh, for the first in this uh, four part series on the art of America uh, and how great American artists reveal the new country and its people. And we're going to be covering uh, over the next uh, uh, months um, how artists looked uh, at the world and showed us the world from the early 19th century through the Great Depression as America evolves through some of its most turbulent and formative years. But before we get started, I do want to thank the Madison Arts Society for its support of the series. And I hope all of you will find it both educational and enjoyable. We do have a lot to cover today, so I'll be moving rather quickly, but I will make sure that we can pause and look at a lot of art. We're gonna start with Colonial America and the art of the portrait in New England and Old England. Uh, I've always had a great love of the art of the portrait because they give us not only an intimate look at the people both famous and some now obscure and also the times they lived in during the early days of our new nation. During the colonial era, artists had one foot in New England and one in Old England. And the artist Benjamin West was one of the best examples of an artist who had a foot in these two worlds and a major presence as an artist. He was born in 1738 in Springfield, Pennsylvania in a house that's now on the campus of Swarthmore College. He was the 10th child of an innkeeper and his wife. When he was a child, Native Americans showed him how to make paint by mixing some clay from the riverbank combined with bear grease in a pot. He would become a painter and confidant to King George III, the man who lost the colonies, and he would immortalize in portraits some of the leaders of the American Revolution who gave birth to a new nation. Benjamin West started this painting of the American delegations at the Treaty of Paris of 1783 with the best of intentions. The treaty negotiated between the United States and Great Britain ended the Revolutionary War and recognized America's independence. Now on the left of the painting, we see John Jay standing. He's standing behind a seated John Adams and Benjamin Franklin. On the far right, not yet painted in would have been the British. But the British delegation refused to pose. <laughs> the painting <laughs> Door sports. was never completed. It's poor sports indeed. Exactly the way it is. Certainly wasn't cricket. <laughs> now, if lightning came from the gods, then it only seems fitting that the man who discovered electricity flying a kite, no less, should be painted like a god, surrounded by celestial Arabs, as West depicts Benjamin Franklin in this painting done in 1816. Now this heroic grand style of painting wasn't by accident. It would be inspired by a journey that Benjamin West would take at the age of 22 that would change his life as it had so many artists before him. In 1760, Benjamin West embarks on the grand tour that would lead him to Rome. And like so many artists before him, including artists like Peter Paul Rubens, Anthony Van Dyke, Sir Joshua Reynolds, who were the models and inspiration for any serious portrait artists of his time. While he was there, and of course, viewing the ruins of the Colosseum, West would discover and be influenced by neoclassicism, which was born in Rome in the mid 18th century at the time of the rediscovery of Pompeii and Herculaneum. 
Its popularity and influence as an artistic and cultural aesthetic would spread across Europe and to America as a generation of wealthy aristocrats and artists finished their grand tour and returned from Italy to their home countries with newly rediscovered Greco-Roman classical ideals. The neoclassical movement coincided with the 18th century age of enlightenment and continued into the early 19th century, profoundly influencing painting, architecture, and sculpture. The painting on the left, The Oath of Horiti by Jacques-Louis David, painted in 1784, 1784, is a prime example of neoclassical history painting celebrating Roman antiquity, brothers, saluting the three swords held up by their father as the women behind them grieve. The brothers have taken a noble oath to fight in mortal combat with warriors from a rival nation state, rather than allowing the two armies to go to war. In the upper right Monticello was built in 1772 is the primary plantation home of Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, who began designing and building Monticello at the age of 26 after inheriting land from his father. Located just outside of Charlottesville, Virginia, Jefferson incorporated neoclassical architecture in the rotunda dome, triangular pediment, and classical pillars. In the lower right, the bust of Washington by the artist Hiram Power, who was lauded as America's foremost neoclassical sculptor. He portrays Washington as a Roman toga draped emperor. Benjamin West was the first American artist to study in Italy. He was sponsored by a wealthy Philadelphian. In Rome, well, West would be transformed and the painter from Philadelphia would become on his return a royal painter in England for King George III. He would even become the president of the Royal Academy of Art following Joshua Reynolds, its founder. In August of 1763, West arrived in England on what he initially intended as a short visit on his way back to America after his grand tour of Italy. Through influential friends and patrons in England, West was introduced to King George III and soon the two men were conducting long discussions of elevating the state of art in England, including the idea of the establishment of the Royal Academy of Art. King George would commission West to paint two of his 15 children Prince William and Princess Sophia. I like how Princess Sophia is pointing to the great lion, the great symbol of Britain, almost as if to say, he could be king someday too. In 1772, King George appointed Benjamin West, historical painter to the royal court at an annual fee of 1,000 pounds. A pound at that time would be worth approximately $100 in today's currency. King George commissioned West to paint the official grand portrait of his resumption of power in 1789, returning to the throne after losing the colonies and regaining his sanity. In the same year, George Washington was unanimously elected president, John Adams his vice president, and the Frenchman Pierre Charles L'Enfant begins to lay out the plan for Washington's capital city. Benjamin West painted his most famous and possibly one of the most influential historical paintings of all time with the death of General Wolfe. It depicts the dying moment of the 32 year old British General James Wolfe mortally wounded at the 1759 Battle of Quebec during the French and Indian War. Britain's defeat of the French was one of the most significant developments in a century of Anglo-French conflict. Britain would gain all of France's colonies from Quebec to Florida. 
Long lines of eager Londoners would marvel at this epic painting when it was first shown at the Royal Academy in London in 1771. West portrays the fallen General Wolf as a Christ-like figure in a composition inspired by Renaissance paintings, like Botticelli's Lamentation of Christ painted in 1490. Although the British were aligned with the Mohawks, the Indian warrior on the left was a completely fanciful idea. No Mohawk or other Indians were known to have fought in this pivotal battle, but by including this figure, West also symbolizes the European ideal of the noble savage, here mourning at the feet of the fallen hero. One of my favorite Benjamin West paintings can be seen at the Yale Center for British Art, where I'm a docent. It's entitled The Artist and His Family, and it was painted in England in 1772. Here we see Benjamin West, the finely dressed man in the upper right, a man of the world, gazing down on his young son and wife, Betsy, who cradles their newborn child, all bathed in window light. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, note how they are in such stark contrast with the two seated figures. Those two men happen to be Benjamin West's father, John, seated on the far right in profile, and his brother, Thomas. They're both newly arrived from America. Now, could there be two more dour looking and drab figures at a family reunion? West portrays his wife, Betsy, and their baby as a Madonna and child, visited by the two Magi in the forms of John and Thomas West, his father and brother. West is the artist dressed in a lavender silken gown and holding his palette and mall stick as markers of his sophistication and profession as a successful artist. But he also echoes the marginalized physical placement of Joseph in traditional nativity scenes. He is a man part of, but still separated from the main story. Benjamin West would have a profound influence on his fellow American painters who would visit and study at his London studio where he kept an open door policy for American artists traveling abroad, providing them not only with a place to stay, but studio instruction, entree into galleries and collections and access to the Royal Academy. This painting called The American School was painted in 1765 by Matthew Pratt, a student of Benjamin West, and it depicts a scene in Benjamin's studio. Benjamin West is the figure standing at the left in the green coat, giving instruction. The artist that flowed in and out of Benjamin West's London studio comprise a who's who of American painters and included John Singleton Copley and Gilbert Stewart. Let's look at works by these two students of Benjamin West. John Singleton Copley, here in his self-portrait, was born in 1738 in Boston. The same year, in fact, as Benjamin West and is most famous for his portraits of the wealthy and influential and a soon to become very famous teapot designer who liked to take midnight rides on his horse. His iconic painting of Paul Revere was done in 1768 and shows us a silversmith holding an example of his trade, a teapot. He's dressed for work in shirt sleeves, seated behind an example of his work at a highly polished table with the tools of his trade scattered at his elbow. He cradles his chin in his right hand and regards the viewer as if he has just looked up from his work as you walked into his shop. Copley dazzles us with how sidelight illuminates 
the figure, the teapot, even reflections of Paul Revere's fingers on the teapot. And of course, the wood tabletop. The painting is one of the treasures of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. The idea of depicting the craftsman at work surrounded by his tools of trade was a popular portrait motif. As we can see in this 16th century portrait of a merchant by the Dutch artist Jan Gossert, painted in 15. 30. Copley's painting of A Boy with the Squirrel, done in 1765, would change his life, elevating him to the highest ranks of portrait painting, not only in Boston, but also in London. The painting depicts his half brother, Henry Pelham, seated at a table, playing with his pet flying squirrel tethered to a delicate gold chain. Copley sent the painting to Benjamin West in London, who marveled at its mastery of painterly technique, detail, and portrait art. Copley is proclaiming in this painting for all to see that he can not only paint a portrait as well as Rubens, Reynolds, and Gainsborough, but also can create a visual story about the subject that will hold and fascinate your attention, which brings the subject to life. The ultimate goal of every great portrait artist. With many letters of introduction, Copley will set sail from Boston to England in June of 1774 and immediately called on Benjamin West, who then introduced him to Sir Joshua Reynolds one of the most influential artists of London society at the time, and the first president of the newly created Royal Academy of Art. But as masterful as Copley's portraits could be, grand historical paintings like the one we saw of Benjamin West, the death of General Wolfe, these paintings remained at the top of the artistic hierarchy of what were considered important paintings. So Copley to show his skill at painting dramatic action filled historic paintings would seize on a sensational contemporary event that would elevate his art and reputation. His painting of Watson and the Shark was painted in 1778 and it depicts the rescue of Brooke Watson from a shark attack in Havana, Cuba Harbor. Brooke Watson, then a 14 year old cabin boy, lost his leg in the attack and was not rescued until the third attempt, which is the subject of the painting. Young Watson would not only survive, but grow up to become the Lord Mayor of London. More than 120 years later, Winslow Homer would be inspired by Copley's men and sharks in one of his most dramatic paintings called The Gulf Stream, created in 1899. We'll be looking at more of Winslow Homer's paintings next month. Well, in England, Copley would carefully study portraits like these by the masters. Portraits of great women of Georgian society. On the left, a portrait by Joshua Reynolds. And on the right, a portrait done by Thomas Gainsborough. Copley would carefully study how these masterfully capture and idealize feminine beauty in the time as demanded by the sitters by the subjects, by society. They'd be posed in a way that gestures, elaborate hairstyles, and particularly flowing silken gowns might dominate. Now, only the rich could afford these portraits, which could pay for an artist's bread 
and butter and a lot of jam. Copley would show that he too was a master of the art form of women in portraits. As we see in these two portraits, Mrs. Daniel Sargent, on the right, Mrs. George Watson. Copley dazzles us with elegant paintings of women of society, and I think he rivals Reynolds and Gainsborough, demonstrating his own mastery of technique in celebrating elegance, fashion, and beauty. Copley is in complete control of creating portraits that not just impress, but wow. John Singleton Copley's portrait of the artist and his family was painted in 1776, and it hangs in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Here we see him in the upper left, holding his paintbrushes, and he's surrounded by those he loved at a much happier time in his life. He was 38 years old in this painting, at the height of his career. But during his last years of life living in London, Copley would experience depression, disappointment, due to declining health and growing debt. Many canvases that took him years to paint went unsold. And his son, a young attorney, would need to provide loans to support his father and his family. Gilbert Stewart was born in Rhode Island in 1755. And his best known work is the unfinished portrait of George Washington, which we'll get to in just a moment. Gilbert Stewart's portraits of the leading figures of the day included John Adams, the second president of the United States, Dolly Madison, the wife of his son, James Madison, the fourth president of the United States. And Thomas Jefferson. This portrait hangs in the Bowdoin College Museum in Brunswick, Maine. This is really one of my favorite paintings. Gilbert Stewart would also apprentice at Benjamin West's London studio, and he would seek portrait art commissions while he's in London. And this portrait, <clears throat> which hangs in the National Gallery of Art, is simply titled The Skater, painted in 1782. And the story of how it was created is absolutely delightful. The subject of the portrait was a well-placed young Scotsman who was in London at the time, his name was William Grant, and he commissioned Stewart for a portrait. But Gilbert Stewart had not yet successfully completed a figure in full length format. He, in fact, had been loath to accept full length portraits at all and was said to have been incapable of painting a figure beneath the fifth button of a man's waistcoat. <clears throat> And to make matters worse, Grant had a different idea when he arrived at Stewart's studio for his portrait. On account of the excessive coldness of the day, he thought it was better suited for ice skating rather than sitting for his portrait. So the artist and subject left for the Serpentine in Hyde Park where the two men took to the ice. Grant, the better skater, engaged in a series of fancy skating maneuvers that attracted an admiring crowd. But the ice started to crack and Stuart rushes out, grabs his coat and pulls him to the safety of the shoreline and walks him back to the studio. When they returned to the studio, Stuart suggested a new composition inspired by their adventures on the ice. And William Grant consented. Stuart then proceeded to paint from memory with the subject, at least there, present. He painted from memory, the subject skating. 
in a painting that is literally larger than life. The painting is four feet by eight feet tall. At the Royal Academy exhibition of 1782, the painting was an immediate sensation, elevating Stuart to the ranks of Reynolds and Gainsborough. Stuart later said that he had been, quote, suddenly lifted into fame by a single picture, unquote. In 1795, Gilbert Stuart returns to America and sets up his studio in Germantown, outside of Philadelphia, and later in Washington, the new nation's capital city. The image of George Washington featured in Gilbert's unfinished portrait from 1796 may be his most well-known work, but why was it unfinished? He also painted an unfinished portrait of Martha Washington, which I believe stayed unfinished. Using the unfinished painting as his primary source, Stuart copied and painted George Washington in a series of finished portraits, each of them leading to a demand for more copies of Washington's portraits. This would keep Stuart busy and highly paid for years. These were the most famous and celebrated likenesses of Washington known as the Athenaeum portrait and is portrayed on the United States $1 bill. Stuart would never complete the original unfinished version and it remained unfinished at the time of the artist's death in 1828. The painting was jointly purchased by the National Portrait Gallery and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston in 1980 and is generally on display in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington. Now, Stuart would explain why Washington's face looked, well, so stiff. Quote, when I painted him, he had just had a set of false teeth inserted, those famous wooden false teeth, which accounts for the constrained expression so noticeable about the mouth and lower part of the face. One of the most celebrated paintings of Washington is the life-size portrait painted by Gilbert Stuart in 1796. It depicts the 64-year-old president during his final year in office. Stuart painted three copies of this portrait with the most famous copy hanging in the East Room of the White House since 1800. The painting was saved during the burning of the White House by British troops in the War of 1812. It was saved through the smart thinking of First Lady Dolly Madison and Paul Jennings, one of President James Madison's slaves and White House French trained chef. After the War of 1812, Jennings would buy his freedom his three sons would fight in the Civil War, and Jennings would help organize one of the largest attempted slave escapes in history. On August 24th, nine family members and descendants of Paul Jennings gathered at the White House around the portrait that Jennings helped to rescue. Awesome. Now, compare the grand historic portrait of Washington with perhaps the most radical painting of an American president ever conceived, President Obama's portrait by the extraordinary African-American artist Kahindi Wiley. Now let's take a short pause for a few questions if you have them. Before we head west in the second part of today's art lecture. Put your hand feature up if you'd like, or you can physically raise your hand and we'll see if we can call on people. Anybody? And you may have questions at the end and that's fine too. I have a question if no one else does. <clears throat> Good. You said that um, after 
King George III lost the colonies, he then regained his sanity. So what was that blip of insanity, dementia, whatever we want to call it? Um, a little bit of all of the above. Uh, King George did suffer from mental illness. It uh, incapacitated him for quite a period of time. And Queen Anne was running much of the government, as well as with their 15 children, a huge household. Actually, only 13 children survived to adulthood. So yes, this is um, uh, something that, in fact, uh, some of you might have seen the movie from a number of years ago, The Madness of King George III. Uh, it was a film that was based on a play. So yes, uh, uh, he does uh, regain uh, the throne and return to the throne. Uh, I'm sure leaving the colonies didn't help his state of mind. Mm, that's Other question. Mm. All right, let us move westward. Now I'd like to move from colonial portraits to an emerging nation west of the Mississippi as 19th century artists like George Catlin, Thomas Moran, George Caleb Bingham and Frederick Remington venture into the frontier with canvas, paint and brush to record native inhabitants, pioneers, cowboys, and a seemingly endless landscape that revealed a new world of beauty and wonder. Few painters have created more dramatic, lavish, and sweeping landscapes of the American West than artist Albert Bierstadt. He was born in Germany in 1830 and brought to America by his parents to live in New Bedford, Massachusetts. In 1859, he boldly headed west with land surveyors and discovered a magnificent new Eden. Bierstadt would infuse his paintings with glowing light, an art movement known as luminism as in this painting of Sunrise in Yosemite Valley painted in 1868. Here Bierstadt captures the moment when the sun breaks free from behind a mountain casting the first rays of light reflected in the river below. The presence of man is nowhere to be seen. All is nature, pristine, unspoiled. When looking at landscapes in the first half of the 19th century, I think it's important to also think about the influence of Romanticism, a movement where artists, writers, and musicians expressed in their work a new emphasis on emotion, such as apprehension, beauty, horror, terror, and awe, and awe, especially experience when confronting the limiting and beauty of nature. But also awe, possibly terror. And I think Bierstadt captures romanticism in the sublimity, awe, and even possible terror of nature in this painting, Storm in the Mountain, done in 18. 70. By 1875, when this painting entitled California Spring was done, much of the West had been populated by waves of immigrants, especially after the discovery of gold in California in 1849. Here in the foreground, cattle can be seen grazing as storm clouds are clearing a visual statement that even though the wild is slowly being tamed, the natural beauty of the West 
forever endures. Look at how the light breaking through the clouds reflects in the river below and shines down and illuminates the white cow. The artist Thomas Moran was born in 1837 in Bolton, England. He was the son of a handloom weaver whose life there was ruined by the advent of the Industrial Revolution. Displaced by labor-saving weaving machinery, Thomas Moran Sr. immigrated to America in 1840 and settled in Kensington, Pennsylvania near Philadelphia. His son, Thomas, here in a portrait by Hamilton, Hamilton, done in 1881, Thomas Moran would become one of the greatest painters of the Western landscape. And his inspiration would be the Green River in Wyoming. This is how the Green River in Wyoming looks today in this photograph. And it would become for Thomas Moran, his ideal subject to paint. Thomas Moran was on his way to Yellowstone in 1878 when the train stopped off along the way at Great River, Wyoming. And he would discover a landscape unlike any he had ever seen before. And he started sketching and later painting many times a subject that for him would be as compelling and endlessly inspiring as water lilies would be for Monet. His painting of the Green River in Wyoming is a masterpiece that captures light atmosphere as it reveals a panoramic Western vista of towering rocks of vivid color, pristine river, endless skies, and light. Moran greatly admired the landscapes of British artist J.M.W. Turner, who also celebrated the magic of light. Moran would in fact travel to London to see and study the works of Turner in person. Like this painting by Turner, the Dort Packet Boat, done in 1880, which hangs as one of the masterworks at the Yale Center for British Art. Look at how Turner envelops in light this maritime scene of ship and sails, reflected light in water beneath a majesty of clouds, soft sunlight. Nearly two thirds of the painting is sky, the rest is water. I often ask students on my tours as a docent at the Yale Center for British Art, where the painting is on display, is this a painting about a boat or light? I think both Thomas Moran and Turner would answer, it's all about the light. Just as in Moran's painting of the Green River, in Wyoming. The artist George Caleb Bingham would portray life on the great highways of rivers that opened the West for millions of settlers. This is a self portrait by Bingham done in 1877. Hangs in the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, Kansas City. He was born in 1811 in Augusta County, Virginia, which is east of Charlottesville. And he went west in 1819. At the age of eight, when his father resettled in Franklin, Missouri, named after Benjamin Franklin. It was a thriving frontier river town on the banks of the Missouri River, south of St. Louis, a town that's since been washed away by floods. 
Many settlers moved west to Missouri, including my ancestors in the 1820s who moved from East Tennessee. They came to Missouri because the land was bountiful, fertile, and cheap. They moved to my hometown of St. Joseph, Missouri. It's one of the great river towns, home of the Pony Express and where Jesse James was shot. As a young boy, George Bingham would have seen many fur traders paddling by on their dugout canoes down the Missouri River, as depicted in one of his most famous works, Fur Traders, descending the Missouri painted in 1845. Surrounded by luminescent light reflecting on the water, Bingham gives us such wonderful detail of nature, water, light, and these travelers floating by on the Missouri. On the right, we see the Frenchman's red gingham shirt, his liberty cap, and a whiff of pipe smoke as he paddles by. Many French fur traders married Native American women and Bingham shows the trader's Native American son on the left with his striking black hair, vivid blue shirt and buckskin pants. The boy lounges with a hunting rifle, beaded leather satchel and a recently shot duck. And both father and son look directly at us, the viewer, making an immediate connection between their world and ours. This detail shows a bear cub, not a cat, a bear cub chained to the bow of the boat, a bear cub that's a pet of the fur trappers. They do grow up to be rather large, so uh, would it be interesting in when they might release that bear back into the wild. What's quite amazing about this iconic American painting was that it may have gone missing until it was discovered by chance in an antique shop collecting dust. And now hangs in the Metropolitan Museum of Art as one of its American treasures. One of the most admired and evocative paintings by Bingham is the Jolly Flatboatman, which hangs in the National Gallery of Art in Washington. Former museum director Rusty Powell described it as, quote, the most important genre painting in American history, unquote. Flatboats were the long haul floating transport trucks on the river. And the Jolly Flat Boatman depicts an everyday scene in 19th century American life. Eight men floating downstream from trading posts along a great Midwestern river, the Mississippi or the Missouri, the artist doesn't say. Some merchants had sent them on a shopping spree. Their boat sits low in the water, the hold filled with merchandise. Again, Bingham delights us with lively detail. One man on the right plays a fiddle. Another young man on the left is banging on a tin pan. In the center foreground, another man is lying on his back, enjoying the show as he watches the man in a pink shirt and blue pants, his arms raised, his hair blowing, dancing up a storm. It's a beautiful day, not a cloud in the sky, just a little bit of mist in the distance, hanging over the river. When Frederick Remington painted The Cowboy in 1902, the era of the lawless West with gunslinging cowboys galloping through the sagebrush was long since past. Yet Remington would create in vivid, exciting paintings what it all really looked like 
because he had been there, seeing the last of the Old West firsthand and painting it all before it all vanished. Frederick Sackrider Remington was an only child, born in 1861 in Canton, New York. He was a cousin of Ella Phillette Remington, who founded the Remington Arms Company, which is considered America's oldest gunmaker, but recently filed for bankruptcy. At 16, Remington wrote to his uncle of his modest ambitions, quote, I never intend to do any great amount of labor. I have but one short life and do not aspire to wealth or fame in a degree which could only be obtained by an extraordinary effort on my part. Remington had imagined a career for himself as a journalist and maybe with art as a sideline. Remington attended the art school at Yale University. But he discovered that football and boxing were much more interesting than the formal art training. Here we see him in the football uniform of the day, canvas jacket and flannel knee breeches. Remington's father died a year after he started Yale and Remington would refuse to go back to art school, living off of his inheritance. At 19, he made his first trip west, going to Montana, at first to buy a cattle operation, then a mining interest. But he soon realized he really didn't have sufficient capital or the talent for either enterprises. But while out west, he submitted some drawings from that first trip to Harper's Weekly the Life magazine of the time. And from those first crude drawings that Harper's Weekly artists would have to redraw and finesse. Nevertheless, a Western painter and an Eastern hero was born. In paintings like A Dash for the Timber, done in 1889, he depicts cowboys in the Southwest shooting at Apaches one of the eight riders, the horseman on the far left is already wounded. He's on his horse with the aid of a fellow rider. Note the terror in the white horse's eyes. This is a painting that may have inspired every Western movie that was ever made. In this painting, Remington displays an impressionist flair for light, brushstroke, and color, and how he incorporates the shadow from the fence railings, leading your eye into the main action of two cowboys trying to control a horse with a new saddle without getting kicked They've tied a rope that connects one of the horse's hind legs to its neck, common practice. And behind them are two cowboys watching the action by an adobe building as the horse tries to bite the cowboy on the left. By the mid 1890s, the cowboy way of life was coming to an end. The expansion of the railroads into cattle country had eliminated the need for the long trail drives to the railheads of Kansas and Missouri. And the great expanse of public grazing lands had been open to homesteaders and sheep herders, enclosing the open range with barbed wire fences. This painting entitled The Fall of the Cowboy from 1895 is a lament for this passing way of life 
the melancholy associated with the demise of a celebrated American figure is captured here with empathy and reverence beneath a sky of gunmetal gray. Two cowboys have stopped in a remote wintry landscape. One of them is dismounted in the snow to open the gate so they can pass through. Barbed wire fencing recedes into the snowy horizon. Some of my favorite Remington paintings are his nocturnals. I first saw these at an exhibition of Remington at the National Gallery of Art in 2012. What makes these paintings so exciting is Remington's technical ability, painting the color of night. Remington would write to a friend that this is something he struggled with over and over. How do you paint the night? In this painting, he forces us to really look and decipher what's going on in the dark. Here, a team of horses gallop down a hill late at night, pulling a stagecoach. The only sound in the night on the plains are wagon wheels and hooves, cries of the dryer, the driver and the crack of his whip. And in the night light, the stagecoach has two lanterns, dimly light the way. In this painting, we see two wolves stalking horses tied to corral railings late on a wintry night. I think you can almost hear the horses snorting and whimpering as the lantern light from a nearby cabin is lit. One of my favorite Remington paintings is called The Scout, Friends or Foe, where a lone Indian on horseback pauses in a starlit winter landscape, bundled against the frigid winter night alone on the open plains. He hesitates for a moment and looks to the horizon and sees tiny campfires. trying to decide that whatever lies ahead, could this be safety or danger, life or death? Frederick Remington seen here with his wife, Eva, died at a young age. He was only 48 years old died in 1909 from complications from an appendicitis. Yet in his short lifetime, he produced more than 3,000 drawings and paintings, 22 bronze sculptures, a novel, a Broadway play, and over 100 articles and stories. He was physically a giant of a man and the work that he produced through his life was awesome. I'd like to finish today's lecture on Western frontier painters, starting where we really began today in the early 1800s. And the work of an artist who may have done more to document the Native American Indian's life than any other person in our history, George Cowan. He was born in 1796 in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, and as a child would spend hours hunting, fishing, and looking for American Indian artifacts in the nearby fields and forests. His mother told him stories of the Western frontier and how she was captured by a tribe when she was a young girl. Trappers, hunters, explorers, and settlers would stay at their family home on their travels west. His father was a lawyer and George studied law and became a lawyer in 1819, but only practiced for two years 
1823 studied art in Philadelphia and developed a love for the art of the portrait. And while in Philadelphia, he met a tribal delegation of Indians from the Western frontier. Catlin would then become eager to preserve a record of Native American customs and individuals. This portrait is one of his most powerful. It shows us a Blackfoot chief in remarkable detail. He confronts the viewer with a steady gaze, his jaws and cheeks painted crimson red, black lustrous hair flowing to his shoulders. His buckskin shirt is adorned with intricate beadwork and he clutches a beaded staff that symbolizes his rank, power and authority as a tribal chief. Catlin's Indian portraits were made during his first trip west, starting in 1830 when he accompanied General William Clark, who had first explored the west 24 years earlier with Mary Weather Lewis. Clark was on a diplomatic mission into Native American territory and between 1830 and 1836, they would visit 50 tribes. These are only a few of the Native American portraits that Catlin would paint. Catlin would not only paint these remarkable portraits, but he also documented their lives and customs like this painting, Medicine Buffalo, of the Sioux done in 1837. It shows us a ceremonial dance that honored the buffalo hunt and the buffalo spirit, all essential to sustaining life on the Great Plains. He also painted everyday village life, depicting a panorama of teepee dwellings. In this delightful work, we see Catlin and his Indian guide with white wolf skins sneaking up on a herd of buffalo. And here we see hundreds, to me it looks like thousands, of Indians playing ball. Catlin would also document the transformation of visiting Native Americans going to and returning from Washington. I wonder if the audience for these Indian portraits saw a disturbing cultural juxtaposition. I doubt it, given the prevailing attitude of most Americans of the time to Native Americans. Catlin returned east in 1838 and assembled his paintings into what he called his Indian gallery and would tour major cities like Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, and New York with his Indian portraits. But he would discover Americans in the 1830s weren't especially impressed. The majority deemed Indians a problem and preferred art to be academically European. After failing to sell his Indian gallery to the US government, which now numbered more than 600 paintings, Catlin brought it to Europe, where the exoticism of his paintings and subjects enthralled Queen Victoria. Catlin had hoped the US government would eventually purchase and preserve his life's work, but continued attempts failed. He would sink into personal debt and would be forced to sell the original Indian gallery to the railroad industrialist, Joseph Harrison, who stored everything in a warehouse in Philadelphia. It wasn't until seven years after his death in 1872 that George Catlin's Indian gallery was donated to the Smithsonian. Today, Catlin's Indian gallery is on permanent view in the Renwick Gallery's Grand Salon.
a crown jewel of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. In 2004, the National Museum of the American Indian opened in Washington, DC. Its architectural motif combines limestone facades with a distinctive curvilinear form that evokes wind and water, sculpted rock, echoing the Native American landscape of the West. The museum's architects and project designer were of Blackfoot, Cherokee, and Choctaw ancestry. This is a view of the museum with the nation's capital in the distance. I hope you enjoyed today's lecture on the art of America. And now we have time for some questions and conversation. But before we do, I uh, want to note that my next lecture on American art will be on the second Tuesday of March at 10 a.m. where we'll zoom in to look at a nation divided a nation restored through the photography of Matthew Brady and the paintings of Winslow Homer, Thomas Akins, and other artists as America experiences the Civil War and its aftermath, as a new nation continues to evolve and recreate itself. I hope you'll join me and thank you for joining me today. How about some, yes, excellent, but questions before we applaud. Do we have uh, questions out there for Bob? Uh, the large paintings that were done out there, were they done plein air to do it or were they based on sketches or watercolors and they brought back to a studio to make those large paintings? That's a good question. Uh, many were done starting with sketches working the sketches up, taking the sketches back to their studio, uh, kind of really working on plein air and in the studio. Um, yes. Any other questions? I have more of a comment, if mm -hmm. I may. I am just so impressed and I realize how little I really know uh, I know Bierstadt and some of the big uh, players, but uh, it's, it's, you know, like Kathleen and uh, uh, Randall, you know, it's, it's Stuart, it, it's pretty amazing. So I'm so pleased that Bob did this lecture and that you presented it to us. Thank oh. you so very much. Thank you. That's one of my fellow docents from the Yale Center for British Art. She has some other docents joined us today as well. Well, I have to tell you, um, for me, it's really kind of a labor of love. I started doing uh, these series of art lectures live in person <laughs> and at the Lyman Allen and colleges and museums and libraries. And for me, I, am a, I love history. Uh, but for me, I love art and a way to tell our history through art and the artists, because aren't we lucky that they really give us, uh, you know, kind of a time machine and a be there now to see what is this world, but what's going on in this world, particularly those early colonial portrait artists, you know, we, we, we have to remember that the colonies before the Revolutionary War, you know, really literally a foot in, in New England and a foot in London, particularly if you're an artist, if you're going to survive. You know, there's some wealthy patrons, certainly in Philadelphia and around there, but, uh, you know, the, the opportunity and the great portrait art is in London with Gainsborough. Reynolds, and we can look at Rubens and Anthony Van Dykes. These are the masters. These are the, these are the goal for anyone doing portrait art and to see these artists master that form. But I think also Benjamin West, uh, who, who I, I, I love because not only of what he does, but this, this kind of reader and home for these visiting artists who would come to London and you know, meet him and he would, 
you know, uh, counsel and mentor and guide and teach these artists. What, a, what an enormous contribution to, to American art. So yeah, it's great, great fun for me. And um, I, I have to confess these, these two lectures were originally about an hour and 45 minutes each, uh, separate lectures. And so quite a bit more art <laughs> and imagery and time, but the thought was let's combine them today and kind of ground us in the art of America uh, beginning you know, in, in uh, the late 18th, early 19th century and looking at what happens after the Revolutionary War and when the West opens up uh, and artists go West. Um, so uh, it's a fun, uh, it's a fun uh, way for me and hopefully for all of you to kind of look at art. Much of it, I'm sure is familiar, but hopefully you discover some new work. But always to me as important, who are the artists? You know, they created the work. They get up in the morning as those artists who are on the Zoom know, and it can be a lonely enterprise and to keep themselves motivated, inspired. And it wasn't so easy traveling West back in those days. So all of you artists, particularly landscape painters on plein air know, you know, Painting outdoors can can you know be a subject uh, that is influenced by the elements and knowing how difficult it was to travel west. Even once the train gets you out there, then to get to some of these places. So I think just the endurance and the perseverance of these artists. But of course they're they're just great talent. And I think also I wanted in looking at Thomas Moran, particularly to acknowledge Turner. And the influence again of Turner and these great landscape artists and the luminous, you know, the Hudson Valley School in New England uh, uh, certainly, uh, you know, established this, this great art of American landscapes, which is, you know, influenced and reflected in, in paintings uh, out West. But this idea of painting light, painting atmosphere uh, again, I think as we look at it, it's it's still just absolutely remarkable. So, again, thank you all. Any any other questions or comments or? Uh, yes, I, mean, I just I just love this presentation. Uh, we were so uh, brought into not only into the mind of the artist as well as to his work, and it was a fabulous presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Hillary, for arranging it and Bob for this. Uh, lecture. Amazing. And Marianne. For and Marianne. Yes, and Mar well, Mar thank you. Marianne. Well, as all, as you know, the, the lecture on Picasso's uh, portraits of women that I did uh, a, a little while ago through the Madison Art Society. And again, the artist, the subject, you know, uh, for me, I went to art school. I'm married to a talented artist. You know, I've been involved in the arts. The artist is, is such an important, it sounds obvious and perhaps trite, but too often I think sometimes we go into museums and we see art on the wall and we think, wow, isn't that great? But uh, someone made it. Someone made it. And oftentimes uh, those of you who are uh, landscape artists who are sitting outside and doing a wonderful landscape and someone comes by and asks you, gee, how long did it take you to do that painting? And uh, depending on your age, but usually the correct answer is something like, oh, about 40, 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully we, we, we always kind of re remember this. This is what these artists have spent, spent their lives doing. And as we also saw, they, uh, some were very fortunate and were uh, made a, a very, very comfortable living like Remington, others uh, would uh, go bankrupt. And uh, that uh, we will see happens more than once in the life of these artists as we go forward. So thank you again, everyone, and hope to see you zoom back in on our on our next on mm. our next get together. I have one one comment. Sure. When you bring us through, you know, from colonial times through the West, um, it's just such a spotlight on how things are so different today with our children and the culture. And if you have not on Netflix, I believe it's called The Social Dilemma. Tune into that documentary right now. 
and check that out, how our kids are being raised through the advent of the internet and Google and Facebook and Snapchat and how our kids are raised on this stuff and changed by this stuff. And in some ways, wonderfully, like us with this Zoom possibility of listening to Bob, but in other ways, horribly. And then compare that to George Catlin when he's a little guy running around looking for arrowheads and meeting Native Americans. I don't know, you know, you said a lot of people, trappers and settlers were coming through his home. I mean, imagine his life, how rich it was. You know, just being out on the prairies, running around. And then the, the, the person who had the pet squirrel. I mean, kids are glued in front of their monitors. It's, it's, it's great to hear this and to hopefully we'll swing back a little bit and appreciate nature and what these artists bring to us, bring our past to our present and remind us of what we can't lose. Kind of lost the Cowboys already as we've learned, but it's all part of who we are and hopefully we'll go forward in the, in the right direction, right the ship a little. Well, I think that's a good point. I think the other thing, and, and my fellow docents from the Yale Center for British Art is uh, we give tours, but you know, very much part of how we give tours is helping the viewer to really look. And again, we, we you know, live in an age where we're bombarded by visual imagery and uh, particularly whether it's on our handhelds or television, it's very quick, it's very fast. The idea of really sitting in front of a painting, uh, in all fairness, uh, I suppose uh, sitting and looking at maybe half of the paintings, particularly the landscapes today and just talking about them and studying them. But that's something that I think is something we are starting to lose and, and has been for some time. And so, you know, once we get back into museums and can really sit and look, uh, we've all been to shows where we see people running around with their iPhone cameras, snapping pictures of everything. And I really seriously doubt if they're actually seeing anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, go buy the catalog, it's in, it's in the gift shop, you know? Like, sit and look. What, what are we, you know, what are we running around taking pictures when you can look at the real, the real thing and really sit and kind of think about it. And, uh, and, and, and so um, I, again, I, I know we looked at a lot of art today and I hope I paused long enough. I hope you got to see enough. Uh, and uh, the next uh, uh, lecture will, will not be quite as much art <laughs> jammed together, but uh, I think that's something that we really need to do. And I think, again, once upon a time, we collected lots of art books <laughs> as I have behind me. <laughs> Sit and open them up and look and read. And that's the best thing obviously we can do for our kids. Put the put the iPhone down and you know pick up a book or you know sit in some on some visual uh, uh, programs, but really start to redevelop and exercise that looking muscle. Because I think we're losing it. And mm -hmm. uh, it's something Hi. Yeah. This is Nancy Armstrong. I just have to put in a word for nature journaling if anybody out there is doing this. It's a terrific way to, as you're talking about, to appreciate what's around us and uh, really been wonderful for me during the COVID epidemic because, um, you know, you're home sometimes with nothing else to do. And uh, anyway, that's it. Well, I think that's a, that's a good point. I think it's gonna be very interesting. We're seeing a lot of what are artists and creative people doing during COVID over the past year. And a lot of amazing things are being done. So not everybody is just watching Netflix. Uh, so, uh, uh, and I think that's gonna be continually uh, very interesting. But again, uh, let's use this time to look at art and learn more about artists. And that's something I also hope, I hope this inspires uh, the, you, the viewers to, gee, I'd like to learn a little bit more about Benjamin West, or uh, I'd like to learn more about Catlin or gee, I, didn't know Gilbert Stewart did anything other than uh, Washington's unfinished portrait, really to kind of, uh, you know, sort of uh, dig in. And I do like to try whenever possible some references that artists would have been aware of at the time 
they did their work, uh, you know, and uh, so good. Well, thank you all. Uh, I don't have a clock in front of me, but hope we didn't run too late. No, we, we're perfect. Excellent. So yeah, no, it's great timing. It's about 1130. And yeah, you were very, very informative and of course, entertaining. And we really appreciate your time. So thank you to you. Um, there, are, there we are sharing again. Sorry, I didn't take my slide down. We could have been looking at each other. Oh, than... that's okay. Um, and thank you to everybody for tuning in. Thank you to Marianne and just everybody that's made this possible. These are really wonderful um, talks that we're starting to use a lot with Zoom. And Bob is our, our man for the next few months. So the next one will be uh, Tuesday, uh, March 9th. Everybody, please tune in. And the title is, is quite poignant, A Nation Divided. Um, so back 100, so however many years ago, around the time of the Civil War, that was, um, I guess that's what you'll be starting off with, focusing on that. But in our times today as well, we, we have some divisions. So art can, can hopefully bring us all together. And it's amazing how a couple of other little things that you how the um i wish i could remember the servant the slave who saved mm -hmm. the painting jennings paul yeah. what was his name jennings paul jennings yeah isn't that amazing, amazing amazing story which i knew a little bit about you have to realize uh researching and putting these together uh, is a real education for me i knew a little bit of that story but uh, when I did a little more research to see the family reunion. That's what I wanted to talk in about. Front now, of, in yeah. front of the, uh, in fr hang on a second, I'll, I'll, I'll pull that back up for you because yeah. it, is, it, is it just, just shows how we're still trying to get things right in our country. As, as wonderful it is, is, there were some horrible, you know, parts of every country. It has its ugly parts, Oops. every country. And okay. we're trying to get it right. And this, Photograph. I made, a, I made a sorry. I made a mistake when I tried to pull that up. Hold on, I'll try it yeah. one more time, because we've all become such masters at this. There we go. No, Shit. we had some blips today. My fault, but and thank then you for everybody. Go down yeah. to this wonderful little thing that gives us all those wonderful paintings at once. Yeah. And let's just pull that up, okay? Which, by the way, we can always we can always do. If someone says, "What was that painting again?" But this was the. Yeah, uh, right there. Here we the go. Photograph. This is the uh, this yeah. is the painting of the reunion. Oh, there. oh, there it is. The photograph. What year was that, Bob? It was there in two thousand nine when there they it got, is. got oh. together. And oh, wow. that's I just, incredible. Yeah, and I and I was and again Google Images, uh, a lifesaver, of course. So when I went to see if there was a a, a photograph or a painting you know, uh, of Jennings. And then I saw not only this great photograph, but also learned more about his story and then saw his family and his descendants. Uh, just, in, 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 the painting wouldn't be hanging there if he and Billy Madison hadn't grabbed it. Uh, That's a heavy thing to grab too. <laughs> that was yeah, no easy. Really, With really. flames all around. Yeah, you know, they uh, certainly had their wits about them, uh, didn't they? And I think, again, that's a good story. There's quite a bit, again, go to the Smithsonian, you can uh, learn more about that. Uh, but also, you know, I, I I'm also can't quite recall if they kind of broke the frame and just rolled it up and got it out yeah. of there or what, you know, but there's there's some, some wonderful history okay. yeah. on, on that. And... Um, the fact that he would go on and his sons would fight in the Civil War and he would uh, lead uh, uh, one, of the, or one of the largest attempted uh, slave escapes. So yeah, look up Paul Jennings, go to, go to Wikipedia and, and learn, mm -hmm. learn about oh, him. Don't go to Wikipedia. Yes, okay. So that, that's amazing. I just wanted to mention that and then also was it 2004, the Native American Museum in DC, how it takes us a while to try to get things right, but you know, slowly we get there. And that, that just brings me to the title of the next talk, A Nation Divided. So hopefully we'll, we will be a nation united <laughs> mm -hmm. again through, through what you're- Well, it gives you some idea of the size of the 
uh, portraits, the something like 600 portraits. But, you know, again, at the time he had invested his life, everything into these portraits and he would tour them. But again, the time was, you know, was there really an interest in this? Uh, uh, in Europe, a great interest, uh, Queen Victoria, but, you know, uh, but without, without this, um, you know, it, would, it wouldn't be until photography would go and take portraits of Native Americans. It was, it was Catlin who showed us uh, and showed us uh, in person at the time with the uh, individuals, you know, posing in front of his canvas. Can you imagine that? Can you just imagine sitting there? Uh, and this is 1832. Amazing. How did he approach Bob, who was friendly? Well, well again, he, 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 he went west uh, with uh, uh, Colonel Clark of the Lewis and Clark expeditions of earlier times, because they were out surveying the west. We've now because of the Louisiana Purchase, we've got a lot of territory <laughs> west <laughs> of Mississippi. <laughs> you know, uh, Jefferson uh, bought a, a lot of land from Napoleon. And so here we have just <laughs> this brand new world that unless you were, you know, fur trappers, uh, no one had seen except native uh, inhabitants. So he goes west with these surveyors. And they're visiting different tribes. And there is much uh, sort of, I'm sure he was strange looking or new or fascinating. Mm -hmm. But his, his, his paintings, uh, again, are just, this is a sort of thing again, uh, and it would be fun to sit with uh, 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 someone from the Smithsonian and just talk about, you know, the dress, the beadwork, the painting, the face painting. What does this all mean? What does this, you know, this all means something. He's of course in a Buffalo robe, we can see that. So yeah, um, can you imagine if we didn't have these? Uh, if, uh, but again, at a time when no one back East was really, really very interested. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah we're fearful. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I'm gonna, say once again thank you so much for your time and for presenting this to us everybody for tuning in Mary Ann for organizing this and we very much look forward to the next one so everybody please tune in and go to our website Madison Art Society ct.org uh, for information or if you'd like to just become a member of the Madison Art Society so everybody thank you and we'll see you again Bob I see some of my friends. I see Lorette Rinlob over there, who is an immensely talented artist who's just moved from Greenwich way up north with her talented husband, John, who's a Yale graduate. So I hope Yale appreciated, uh, John appreciated that picture of Remington at Yale <laughs> in his football <laughs> uniform. And uh, it's fun to see uh, familiar faces. And uh, uh, again, uh, thank you all for, for zooming in and uh, we'll see you again in a month. Stay okay. healthy, thank go you. get your Bye vaccines. Bye everybody. Thanks Bye. again, Bob, Marianne. Bye-bye.